This is Dr. James S. Spiegel in his teaching on Christian ethics. This is session number 13, Sexual Ethics. Okay, so let's turn our attention now to sexual ethics. And here there are a number of questions that we will address, including these. What obligations do we have regarding our sexual conduct? What philosophical and theological values should guide us as we think about sex? And when, if ever, are homosexual relations morally permissible? Now let's begin by talking about uh, what's generally regarded as the, the modern permissive view on sexuality and some of the ideas of Bertrand Russell, who was a British philosopher who lived in the uh, 20th century. Um, he wrote an essay in the 1930s where he proposes a new sexual ethic. Uh, and it's interesting to note that his views were very radical in his day uh, just from a historical perspective, it's, it's helpful uh, t just to note um, how Bertrand Russell, among other uh, philosophers uh, of his time, impacted the, uh, the evolution of views in the West regarding sexuality and sexual conduct. So, uh, one of the things that Russell endorses is premarital sex. He says it's unlikely that a person without previous sexual experience will be able to distinguish between mere physical attraction and the sort of congeniality that's necessary in order to make a marriage uh, a success. So he's uh, in favor of premarital sex. He also uh, was a proponent of uh, easy divorce, which was extremely difficult and um, uh, you know, hard to, um, or, or much harder to achieve back in the 1930s um, before no-fault laws and so on. He thought that divorce should be um, possible just through mutual consent of uh, the couple. And he regarded uh, traditional Christian sexual morality as uh, problematic and really as a result of uh, modesty and, and jealousy. He concludes uh, this particular essay by noting that, <clears throat> as he puts it, it would be well if men and women could remember in sexual relations to practice the ordinary virtues of tolerance, kindness, truthfulness, and justice. So he, I guess he's offering kind of a virtue ethic approach to sexual morality there. But uh, it's interesting to observe that there are a few important virtues there that are missing from his list, at least that Christians would recognize as, as very important for, for guiding us in the area of sexual conduct. I would say, in particular, uh, purity and faithfulness. Anyone? Uh, seems like those are important virtues uh, that we should um, consult and prize as uh, important when thinking about sexual morality. Certainly, Scripture places a huge emphasis on sexual purity and faithfulness. One of the Ten Commandments focuses on that. Um, another orientation, which would be more in keeping with a traditional Christian sexual morality um, <clears throat> advanced by or defended by a guy named Thomas Mapes, is Kantian in its uh, uh, approach. This guy, Thomas Mapes, applies um, certain aspects of the, the Kantian ethic to, to sexual uh, ethics and specifically applies the uh, second version of Kant's categorical imperative, which says that we should not treat people as mere means. We remember uh, that from, from, uh, from Kant's ethics. Always treat people 
as ends and never as means only. So Mapes asks, what does this imply regarding um, how we treat people sexually? What does it mean to use someone sexually? Um, so he notes that the key to understanding what it means to use someone sexually is uh, this, this concept of voluntary informed consent. Okay, when, <clears throat> when you use someone sexually, use them as a means to an end, um, that is to, to violate their voluntary uh, informed consent. And he notes some of the ways that this uh, may be undermined. Uh, there, are, there are two ways that one uh, may be robbed of their voluntary informed consent, uh, either through coercion or deception. If uh, a person is coerced, that's obliterating their voluntariness uh, if they are deceived, then that obliterates their informantness. So coercion and deception. Mapes notes that sex with a child or a severely mentally handicapped adult is necessarily a case of using another person because they cannot give their informed consent. Um, his point here also seems to condemn NAMBLA, which is the North American Man-Boy Love Association, which is all about eliminating age of consent laws. Um, <coughs> interestingly, tellingly, Russell's ethic does not seem to necessarily condemn that. Um, so, uh, any form of intentional deception through lying or withholding information that would prompt a person's uh, consent for sex is a, um, is a case of using someone and is therefore immoral. Of course, there are many cases where people lie, say they, they tell, a man tells a woman that you know, he's single, he's not married, or he withholds the information that say he's HIV positive, um, that would improve his chances of having a sexual encounter with the person. Um, <clears throat> but that is intentional deception. And so it, it violates uh, uh, informed consent. So what forms might such uh, deception take? Um, Um, besides the, the ones that I just noted, we can think of other examples uh, as well where a person lies, deceives, or whatever. There's a lot of, of different ways that a person may deceive. Uh, and then there are different ways that a person may coerce. Um, and this is, uh, you know, the prototypical example, of course, is forcible rape. And that is physical uh, coercion, but there are other forms that sexual coercion may uh, take, and MAPES distinguishes two kinds of, of sexual coercion, occurrent <coughs> coercion is uh, using direct force, but there's also dispositional coercion where a person doesn't use direct force but uh, uses the threat of harm in order to coerce someone into sex. And in clarifying what, what this dispositional kind of coercion is, uh, Mapes distinguishes between a, a threat and an offer. A threat is a situation where noncompliance will bring an undesirable consequence. An offer is where compliance brings a desirable consequence, an inducement, say. He gives the example of a, a professor who, uh, in the one case, could make the threat to a female student that, you know, if you, if 
you don't have sex with me, then your grade is, is going to suffer. Uh, that's a threat. <clears> that's <throat> an undesirable consequence used to coerce the student. Or, uh, and this is probably more common when it comes to these sorts of contexts, <clears throat> an offer might be made. You know, you, you can get an A, you know, if you do this. Um, that's an inducement to sex that's still a kind of co dispositional coercion. <clears throat> and there might be an implied threat even in the offer. Um, so um, those are different ways in which uh, coercion, dispositional coercion, may take place. <clears throat> okay, let's turn now to some of the uh, ideas of uh, Roger Scruton, who um, uh, applies an Aristotelian virtue ethic to sexuality, and he defends um, uh, a traditional Christian view that sex is appropriate only in monogamous <coughs> marriage. So Scruton um, endorses a, a, a sexual morality that would be um, basically a Christian sexual ethic. <coughs> um, he notes that erotic love is a kind of virtue that contributes to human well-being or happiness. <coughs> um, you don't have to have erotic love in your life, but it's something that um, most of us desire, and it certainly can and does enhance a person's overall happiness. <coughs> but in order for a person to experience virtuous erotic love, it needs to be practiced monogamously. And Scruton says that's the case for uh, a couple of reasons. First of all, when, uh, since erotic love is about union, it's prone to jealousy. Um, so a virtuous life of love must eliminate that. <coughs> and <coughs> one thing that can contribute to that is a vow, a solemn vow of commitment, which of course is what happens in a, uh, a marriage ceremony. <coughs> He also notes that sexual expression that is not constrained within a marital commitment contradicts its proper role as an expression of one's whole self. Um, so he notes that where there's a habit of sexual passion without commitment, the entrance of commitment will drive out passion. I saw a bumper sticker once that said, is there sex after marriage? Uh, kind of paralleling the question, is there life after death? But that bumper sticker uh, seems to be coming from the perspective of someone who believes that somehow marital commitment um, destroys erotic passion and that uh, the best kind of sexual life is one where you are not constrained through uh, marital commitment. That's exactly the opposite of the truth, according to Scruton, that in fact, um, the best place for erotic uh, love and uh, passionate sex life is within a marital context and it's certainly the most healthy just from a, of avoiding a, a jealousy, um, a problem with uh, jealousy, Scruton would argue, um, through the vow of commitment. But there are many other reasons why <coughs> um, marriage just within, or sex just within marriage uh, is the best. He notes that the empirical facts confirm this. Um, as monogamous couples are more sexually satisfied. Uh, surveys show that's definitely the case. Um, uh, actually, one study I saw that was 
pretty widely publicized a few years ago, uh, confirmed that um, conservative Christian women are the most orgasmic. Uh, and <clears throat> that's something that would not be expected by you know, our popular culture. Uh, and certainly Hollywood, which you know, celebrates uh, free love, free sex, uh, outside of any kind of marital commitment. Um, and also there are higher divorce rates for couples who uh, cohabitate before marriage. So again, this uh, completely contradicts uh, Bertrand Russell's idea that, well, you're going to improve your chances at a successful marriage if you live together before marriage. And all the opposite is true. Uh, in fact, your chances are better if you don't live together before marriage. A few interesting quotes on cohabitation. Uh, this is from a couple of uh, authors, uh, Waite and Gallagher. It's Ma Maggie Gallagher, uh, who's written a lot of, uh, uh, published a lot of articles on sexuality um, and marriage. They say that on average, cohabiting couples are less sexually faithful, lead less settled lives, are less likely to have children, are more likely to be violent, make less money, and are less happy and less committed than married couples. And here's a quote from C.S. Lewis, who says that the monstrosity of sexual intercourse outside of marriage is that those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one kind of union, the sexual union, from all other kinds of union which were intended to go along with it and make up the total union. So, I think those are some interesting and uh, important observations. <clears throat> so let's talk uh, about some of the biblical grounds for monogamy. It is the biblical view that uh, uh, it should be a man and a woman who unite and are given to one another in marriage. Um, and the, the metaphor that, uh, that is used in scripture, and it's actually, it seems like more than a metaphor, <clears throat> is this phrase of one flesh. As uh, the writer of Genesis says, that the Lord made a woman, Eve, from the rib he had taken out of the man, Adam, and he brought her to the man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh as Adam puts it, you know, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. <clears throat> that is the origin of um, the uh, two human genders, which Jesus harkens back to when he's asked about divorce in Matthew uh, 19, saying what God has joined together, let, let no one separate the biblical command not to commit adultery, um, which is uh, part of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> and marriage is a metaphor for Christ and the church. You think about this deep metaphysical union between Christ and the church and that the Apostle Paul uses marriage as the metaphor for that. It just reinforces the significance of the marital union and uh, monogamy. Um, <clears throat> the importance of biblical, uh, the importance of sexual purity from a biblical standpoint is, uh, that's a recurrent theme in the scriptures. We're told that believers are, we're members of Christ and one with him. And so, uh, that places a real premium on sexual uh, purity, as Paul says. I, why would I want to unite myself to a prostitute when, it is, uh, when I am uh, <clears throat> a part of Christ? And I am a temple. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. See notes in 1 Corinthians 6. Here's another point that um, I think should be emphasized more regarding um, human sexuality and procreation and how that mirrors the Trinity. So, 
it is uh, a teaching in the classical Christian creeds that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the union of the Father and the Son. And the three share the same nature. <clears throat> in fact, the, the Son proceeds eternally from the Father, and then the Son, or the, uh, from the union of the Father and the Son, the, the Holy Spirit proceeds eternally. These three persons of the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit is no less divine for this, but shares the same nature as the Father and the Son. Well, note the parallel here as with the union of, the, of a human father and mother precedes a child, which is no less human, shares the human nature, uh, is the same human essence. There's a, there's a parallel here between divine procession, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the union of the Father and the Son, and human procreation as a child proceeds from the union of the father and the mother. Is that just a coincidence? Or is it um, a, a deeply important metaphysical fact about human nature and how the, the human family mirrors uh, the Holy Trinity? Um, I think that this really uh, underscores the, uh, the sacredness of human sexuality and procreation. So let's move on to um, the topic of homosexuality. <clears throat> Scott Ray notes that the term homosexual, which is itself uh, going out of, uh, of fashion or popular usage, and I think the preferred terminology now is uh, same-sex attracted or same-sex uh, activity. But the word homosexual itself is uh, ambiguous. We could mean by that someone who's sexually inverted, that's Scott Ray's term, uh, referring to those who exclusively are attracted to their own gender, as opposed to someone who's situationally homosexual, someone who's had homosexual experiences, same-sex sexual experiences, uh, but they're not oriented in that way in the sense of uh, a predominant attraction. So the term homosexual itself is uh, a bit ambiguous. But a key distinction we need to keep in mind here is uh, that between homosexual attraction and homosexual practice. So one could be involved in homosexual activity, conduct, and not really be attracted in that way. Or someone could be attracted in a same-sex way and never, uh, never get involved in homosexual practice. As for the causes of homosexuality, um, this question is often asked, uh, is this homosexual predisposition uh, genetic or acquired? Uh, and there's a lot of debate about this, and uh, the evidence is, uh, seems to be inconclusive at this point. Um, there have been a lot of neuroanatomic studies done regarding the brain, um, but the most interesting and I think relevant studies are the, the genetic ones, particularly twin studies, uh, which inquire into concordance rates between identical twins. Concordance having to do with uh, just similarity or uh, agreement in terms of the, the orientations of identical twins. If homosexuality has a completely genetic cause, then there should be a 100% concordance rate, whether, whether heterosexual or homosexual, between identical twins, okay? Uh, and that should be true both for twins who are raised, to get, raised together or adopted away. Um, some of the early studies uh, were conducted by uh, a researcher named Franz Kalman, and he uh, 
found a 100% concordance rate, um, <clears throat> but his studies are, have been roundly criticized. One, because the subjects were all institutionalized or mentally ill. And most importantly, there were no adopted away twins involved in the study. Still, despite these problems, unfortunately, this study is often cited as definitive, despite a number of subsequent studies which have found only anywhere from 10 to 50% concordance rates. Here are some of those studies. The Bailey and Pillard studies <coughs> found a 50% concordance rate for identicals raised together. That's noteworthy um, by itself, but then only a 22% concordance rate for non-identicals. Um, they find, they conclude that genetics is one contributing cause. Uh, but p potential problems with their studies um, uh, include the fact that concordant twins tend to respond more frequently to research advertisements. I don't know how that was discovered, but that's a critical observation that's been made. And in most cases, sexual orientations of both twins were not reported directly, uh, but by some you know, third party. More recent studies conducted by King and McDonald have found a lower concordance rate than Bailey and Pillard found. <coughs> um, and uh, they inadvertently found what they say is a relatively high likelihood of sexual relations occurring between identical twins. So this behavior could account for a significant percentage of the concordance rates uh, among identicals, confirming what some earlier researchers have, had theorized about the role of incest. <coughs> so here are very tentative conclusions. Um, and this is, you know, an ongoing debate, but uh, ge that genetics cannot be the, ro the sole factor uh, when it comes to a homosexual disposition because the concordance rate is, is, uh, is less than 100%. Um, anyway, given the selective pressures against this trait, think about it just from a microevolutionary standpoint, <coughs> there are selective pressures against this. Some non-heritable factors have to be there to renew this um, generation after generation. And that's where the environmental factors come in. Um, genetic factors, we may tentatively conclude, probably play some role, maybe 30 to 50 percent, um, along with environmental and behavioral factors, um, such as developmental challenges to gender identify with one's same-sex parent, which is often cited as significant. Okay, so what are the ethical implications of the causes of homosexuality? Um, here's how I would answer that, that even if there is some biological basis for a homosexual orientation, there are no ethical implications unless one is a hard determinist. And by hard determinist, I mean this is the view that uh, all human choices are caused and therefore we are not free. If we believe that human beings have free will, then even if there is some sort of you know, biological or even biological and uh, environmental determinant to a particular disposition, if we have free will in any significant sense, then we still have the freedom to choose how we will act. Um, just as someone who has a, uh, uh, an alcoholic disposition. Genetically, they're still free to choose. I have a brother who's an alcoholic. He's been sober for about eight years now. And he freely chooses to uh, abstain. He's been doing that consistently all these years, even though he has that predisposition. Um, 
there are causal influences on every aspect of our being, um, <clears throat> but our choices are still free. And so if a person does have a certain same-sex attraction or disposition, they're still free to choose whether or not to act on that disposition. Still, we need to uh, exercise compassion and sensitivity towards those who struggle in this area because that's still a very significant thing, an attraction or disposition to be attracted in that way. Um, finally, let's uh, consider some biblical texts regarding homosexuality. Um, <clears throat> where does the Bible speak to uh, homosexuality or same-sex uh, activity? And exactly how, in Genesis, Genesis 19, there's a famous passage where God destroys Sodom, um, apparently mainly because of uh, sexual immorality, including uh, homosexual practice, which the writer of the book of Jude makes clear, even if it's only implicit in that Genesis 19 narrative, the writer of Jude makes it clear that that is why God destroyed that city. In Leviticus 18 and 20, both of those passages refer to um, sexual relations between men as detestable, and in the latter case, punishable by death. In 1 Tim Timothy 1, 8 to 10, and 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, those passages refer to uh, homosexual offenders as lawbreakers and not inheriting the kingdom of God, respectively. In Romans 1, we find the, the most extensive discussion of homosexuality in the Bible. Uh, there, Paul condemns um, unnatural relations and indecent sexual acts by both men and women in verses 24 to 27. Now, uh, those who take a, a more uh, liberal approach to these passages have offered a number of an alternative um, interpretations of this passage. And here are some of those alternative uh, interpretations. Some have argued that this passage just forbids homosexual male prostitution. Paul is not meaning to uh, condemn all homosexual uh, activity. Uh, another interpretation insists that Paul is condemning true heterosexuals who engage in homosexual acts. So if someone is naturally oriented in a heterosexual way, but they have homosexual uh, <clears throat> experiences uh, in spite of that, then that would be unnatural for them. Uh, while it would not be unnatural for someone who is uh, oriented in a homosexual way. So it's, uh, Paul's not condemning all homosexual activity according to that interpretation. <clears throat> Thirdly, some argue that Paul is condemning perverse expressions of homosexuality as opposed to committed homosexual relationship. So what he's condemning there is homosexual promiscuity, which is unnatural. And what he would condone or approve of, according to this interpretation, is um, a monogamous homosexual relationship. The standard historical, traditional uh, interpretation of this passage, though, is that Paul does intend to condemn all homosexual behavior, uh, whether or not it involves male prostitution, whether or not um, it accords with one's you know, natural disposition or desires, uh, and whether or not it's uh, in a context of a committed monogamous relationship. According to Scott Ray, and I, I think he's right about this, the, this is the only interpretation that does not read into the passage things that are not there. And when you look at the scholarship on this issue and you see how sc some scholars have defended these alternative interpretations, it's always very strained at best. And there's um, reading into this passage things that are just not there. 
Here, finally, is some uh, recommended reading. Uh, these are five of the best resources on this issue that I've seen, specifically homosexuality um, and marriage, um, <clears throat> and just sexual ethics generally. Uh, but um, Anderson, George, and, and Gerges have written a book called What is Marriage? Man and Woman, a Defense. It's an actual, excellent uh, treatment of the issue. Kevin DeYoung's What Does the Bible Really Teach About Homosexuality? Robert Gagnon, this is uh, probably the best treatment of the issue in the English language. The, the Bible and Homosexual Practice, Texts and Hermeneutics. Um, Robert Riley's book uh, called Making Gay Okay, How Rationalizing homosexual behavior is changing everything. Is a fascinating, uh, you know, kind of cultural study uh, regarding the issue. And uh, the best thing I've ever read on human sexuality, period, is uh, John Paul, Pope John Paul II's uh, theology of the of the body. It's about 700 pages long. I've only read pieces of it actually, uh, but I've read Christopher West's book. Theology of the Body for Beginners. It's a nice introduction to this, uh, this massive magnum opus on the topic. Um, it is just tremendous. It, I think I can safely say it's, it's the best thing ever written on human sexuality uh, in all of human history. <laughs> it's a bold claim, but um, there are a lot of people who agree with me on that. And there's a lot that has been written on <coughs> that particular volume. And you can, if you go online, you can find uh, some very helpful notes on uh, Pope John Paul II's Theology of the, of the Body uh, that, can, that condense helpfully his, uh, his, his points into just 20 or 30 pages. But it's profound stuff. And he really emphasizes how human, not just human nature, but human sexuality uh, really is ultimately grounded in uh, the Trinity, or at least the, the Trinity is where we need to look in terms of guiding our, our thinking about uh, sexual conduct. So I highly recommend that, uh, as well as these other resources. This is Dr. James S. Spiegel in his teaching on Christian ethics. This is session number 13, Sexual Ethics.